Thank you very much, uh, everyone. We'll see if my voice can uh, uh, can last for eight minutes, or perhaps uh, perhaps I can even wrap a little earlier than that. I'm Bill Shireman. I'm with Future 500. We are a group that brings together unusual coalitions on behalf of the causes of sustainability and, uh, and, and forward solutions that are systemic in nature. I want to leave you with two messages in particular at the, at the end of this conference, and two messages that I've learned over the course of my life. And because many of the folks in this room are young and just beginning your lives as activists, I particularly want to leave you with this because the power that you will find to change the world, if you truly understand this, is extraordinary. Don't wait for a couple of generations for this to become embedded in you and for you to recognize it, because it's true right now. And number one is that we have allies in places that we have never imagined. Never imagine, never be a Glenn Beck you know, on the left, or never be a Glenn Beck in the environmental community. Every community out there has folks that support the objectives that you want to reach. And they need to be found and brought into the coalitions because they are the margin of victory. And number two, we have power that we have never used. Power that we've left on the table, untapped, because we made presumptions that that power was not available to us. And it is. Let me give you a couple of stories. First, as I said, Future 500 is a group that builds coalitions, often between groups that begin by hating each other, between groups on the left and on the right, between corporations and activist groups, between groups that have been, been diametrically opposed to one another. Um, as an example, a few years ago, I got uh, called by the, uh, by the heads of Mitsubishi Motors and Mitsubishi Electric, and they told me that a strange thing was happening. This group called Rainforest Action Network was outside their buildings. They were scaling their buildings and unfurling banners, calling them the world's largest destroyers of rainforests. They were breaking into um, auto shows, and they were chaining themselves to the steering wheels of, of their cars and calling the media. And the executives said they just didn't understand this. Why, you know, why is this group focusing on our company? We're an auto company and electronics company. Uh, and of course, they concluded that this group must be crazy. They must be just off the wall. What, you know, what, what are they trying to do? They're lying about our companies. We have nothing to do with the rainforest. Well, it turns out that Rainforest Action Network was targeting them because another Mitsubishi company was involved in timber uh, harvesting. And that began a battle. We got in between the partisans. Uh, the head of Mitsubishi Electric, the CEO of Mitsubishi Electric here in the United States, Tachi Kiyuchi, um, took a different approach in terms of his response. He said, these people may be crazy, but this is part of our marketplace. I have to learn what's happening in the rainforest. So he went to the rainforest that Ran had called attention to in Malaysia. He learned about the issues. He became personally dedicated to change. And then, we organized a series of meetings between the founder of Rainforest Action Network, Randy Hayes, and Tachi Kiyuchi. The first meeting, they couldn't even look each other in the eye. There was so much animosity, so much assumption of this is the evil corporation, this is the group that's blasting our name. But they soon came to realize that they had a common purpose. And from that meeting, we developed a set of 10 steps that the companies could take to begin to save the rainforests. And among those steps was that they would cease to use any uh, timber or paper products from old growth clear cuts. And that step that they took, followed by 400 other companies that they persuaded to take the same step in North America, changed the patterns of consumption for timber in the entire North American region. Then we got a call from another company Macmillan Bodell, the largest timber company in North America, that said, you know, we're getting new signals from the marketplace. People want sustainably harvested timber. And we noticed that you did a deal between Rainforest Action Network and Mitsubishi. Can you come and talk to us about doing the same thing so that we can look at changing our timber practices? So we spoke to their executives. We got them together. 
with Greenpeace, Sierra Club, Clackwood Sound, and other groups. And over the course of a weekend, we developed a new harvesting regime for the company that put them on the road to sustainable development that wiped out their, their uh, old growth clear-cut policy within five years. That led to their competitors taking similar steps. That led to Home Depot being able to take to establish a procurement preference for sustainable wood, which changed the entire global market for timber and led to what the head of Rainforest Action Network called the biggest step forward in North American forest protection in 17 years and what the head of the timber company called the future of forestry. That's the kind of change that can happen when you bridge these differences. Now, as a long-term kind of corporate campaigner myself, which I you know, did as a PERG activist in college and, and in high school and, and, uh, and, and before, um, thank you very much. I take note of a, of a great article today in the paper that, uh, that talks about our group, Future 500, by Dan, Dan Fisher. And I don't know if Dan is in the audience today or not. But he says, uh, Future 500, who's uh, looked at their website, website proposes a preemption of the EPA's authority, uh, corporate tax breaks, and other nasty provisions to win corporate support for a carbon tax. Uh, we'll see how this workshop on building Republican support for a price on carbon materializes, but let's hope it doesn't mean something uh, surrendering our fleet before we even um, battle. Totally understand the concerns that folks have. But the reality is there is a potential to pass a carbon tax across the board in the United States. There is a coalition in waiting and what the activist community needs to do in the next two years to make that happen is exactly what Dan says right here. Hope the conference concludes with a plan that truly empowers grassroots organizing before beltway, ad beltway advocacy. Here's what needs to happen. And this, I can tell you from, from uh, uh, deep knowledge of where the, where the potential for change is. We have plenty of advocates within the companies that are the top brands and, and leading, uh, leading companies that are not directly connected to the coal sector. Look, outside the coal sector, the problem with cap and trade was that the deal was done with the coal sector. That's the wrong sector uh, to, uh, to, uh, do the, to do the first deal with. Focus your attention on expanding the number of companies that come out publicly in support of a price on carbon. Focus your attention on them. There are many people within that want to say yes, but they won't do it if they get 30 different requests from 30 different organizations. A uniform ask that this is what we need is what will bring them aboard. If all activists can sign on to a uniform ask like the one that the Price Carbon Campaign has put forward, those companies can sign on. And that includes companies across the board, some of the top brands in the, in the world. They have the supply chains to drive that position down their supply chains into every state who's, who's members of Congress we need to support to make this happen. And that will begin to make the change that we need to bring a price on carbon to the country and to make the other changes that are needed to, to turn this society toward a sustainable economy. Dan concludes by saying, we've got to get to the systemic roots of the problem, the fossil fuel economy. It's a symptom of the, of the system that produces war, economic inequality, racism, patriarchy, and heterosexism. Well, he's about right with that. The way to do that is to begin by taking this step, changing the system so that the price on carbon turns the profit advantage to sustainability and not to consumption. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity.